returning from America in 1933 with very highly blown ideas of Pan-Africanism, the black man in the world, and so on and so forth. But he was very vulnerable. He was a poor person, and he, he, he wasn't getting the kind of help that he, he, he desired. He had applied for jobs to many organizations and many agencies back home in Nigeria, and none of them had given him a job. And he arrived in London on his way back home, and that vulnerability put him in the hands of uh, the colonial authorities. Basically, what happened, the British didn't, uh, the British respected the Yoruba, but they didn't particularly like the kind of black man that the Yoruba were. They didn't like it. Because by the time they came, the Yoruba were already fairly highly educated. They had been producing graduates from the last years of the of the 1850s. And by the time that the British began to come into Yoruba land in the 1880s, 1890s, there were already very many Yoruba graduates in very many areas of life. And uh, when the British finally uh, uh, became the rulers of Nigeria. I'm, I'm, I'm jumping over a whole lot of things. Uh, they, they didn't fancy the Yoruba at all. They might be friends with the individual Yoruba people because the educated people for them to be friends with were mostly Yoruba. But they feared that the Yoruba were going to make the profits of colonialism difficult to achieve in, in Nigeria. So, the British didn't particularly like the, British, uh, the Yoruba and thought that they needed to subdue the interests of uh, the, the, the influence of the Yoruba people in Nigeria. And according to the account in the book that I have quoted, a fatherless people, Madhuri Pera, who was a scholar of the colonial establishment, got hold of a uh, Namdi Azikwe took him to meetings with British colonial officials from Nigeria who were at the time in London and finally arranged a meeting between him and a team of people from the colonial office. And what seemed to have happened in those meetings is that the British wanted to construct the Igbo and the Yoruba as enemies of one another. So that they would not be able to collaborate. Because these are the two most powerful people in Nigeria. If the Yoruba and Igbo collaborated, the British thought that uh, that would be the end of all the benefits from colonial, from their colonial endeavor in Nigeria. And so as Igbo arrived in Nigeria, the man who had left London with very high-sounding ideas of the black race, the black man, uh, and so on, Pan-Africanism, and etc. Arrived in Nigeria, uh, not so much dedicated social to those ideals anymore, uh, and so on. But as I said, we, the Yoruba and the Igbo, we allowed ourselves, we we allowed ourselves to be pitted against each other. Uh, I, I don't want to tell the story. The story I want to tell is the story of change of the future. We are now at a point in the history of the Yoruba and the Igbo nations when a substantial number of the Igbo and Yoruba people now recognize the following things. One, that because we had chosen to allow ourselves to be used against each other, the Yoruba nation and the Igbo nation allowed themselves to be used against each other in Nigeria, both have now ended up in a position that is only better than, 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 than slavery in Nigeria. They have lost everything. And now they're just fumbling around in the hands of uh, people who are dedicated to an idea that they must own Nigeria, they must rule Nigeria, they must control Nigeria, and they must make sure that the other peoples of Nigeria do not control their own destiny. That's what uh, uh, 
that's what I'm going to say. Uh, uh, 11 days after independence in 1960, on October 12, we, the, the South we treat as conquered territory. We must treat the South as conquered territory and not let them ever rule over us and never let them control their own future. I had participated in, F, in discussions around Tifaolo as one of the young intellectuals from IFE, in which we had very definitively decided that the road forward for either the Yoruba or the Igbo is that the two of them must learn to work together. But nothing had come out of those discussions. In 1984, May, after I was released from detention by, uh, by the military ruler Buhari, Chief Aula invited me to Kenya and we spent a whole day together at his house. And I want you to listen to the letter, but listen to this. Because it, it's a story that I need to be telling, to be standing on rooftops in, in Igoland and Yoruba land and be shouting. We spend the whole day, Chief Aula, you know, usually when we meet, it's about Nigeria and Nigeria, and we spend the whole day talking about the prospects, the difficulties, the plan, and so on and so forth for Nigeria. And then uh, it was time for us to go to dinner about 435. And as we stood and went towards the dining table, Chief Aula stopped me and held my hand and said, Banji, there is something more I should not forget to tell you. So I stopped and looked at him, and he said, Banji, you, we Yoruba, must find a way to work with you. Uh, I, I said, you and Igbo will work together. It's not a question of must now. You and Igbo, he was now talking as if he was prophesying. He had started by saying you and you, Igbo must work, work together. But then he up, upgraded the, the, his, his talk to something like a prophecy. You and Igbo will work together. It is the only way you can be free in the world. It is the only way we can be free in the world. It is the only way we can really achieve what we deserve in the world.